Good evening. How are you tonight? May I again have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while? What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? This program that is particularly designed and, uh, and focused on uh, the Bible, the wonderful, wonderful foundation upon which we can build our lives because the Bible is God's word. It is absolutely true and pro trustworthy. It is sharing with us the wisdom of God. Oh my, sometimes we think we're pretty wise, but really, really our wisdom uh, fades into nothing compared with the marvelous wisdom of God. Oh yes, many times we read something in the Bible and we say, oh, that doesn't look very wise to me. And maybe on the short haul, for the moment, it doesn't look very wise. But if we faithfully do what God has declared for the long haul, for the long time, it is going to work out f f always for the best because God is God. And uh, he has uh, spoken to us from his infinite mind, his infinite wisdom, and uh, therefore, we can never, never go wrong when we do it God's way. Now, we receive many uh, letters from around the world, and we have one here from a listener in, um, let me see, in, um, in uh, India, a listener in India, asking about a very uh, curious statement in uh, Revelation 17, where it talks about Mystery Babylon. Let me turn to that a moment and uh, uh, look at that verse. We read in uh, uh, Revelation 17 uh, 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 about a woman that was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And the question uh, from India is, why is uh, she called a mystery? What is the idea of a mystery? Well, you know, the Bible uses the word mystery from time to time because there are aspects of truth and many aspects of truth that God uh, keeps as a mystery. For example, when we go to Ephesians chapter 3, we read there about how the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about 2,000 years ago, said a mystery had been revealed to him Namely, that it was God's intention to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. Now, it had been written about in the Bible, or it, uh, that particular piece of information. Uh, we can find many verses in the Old Testament that anticipated this truth, but God had not uh, opened the spiritual eyes of anyone up until that time or uh, to really understand this, that the gospel was to go also to the Gentile world, uh, beginning with the apostles uh, and then uh, finally locking it in with the apostle Paul as he and Barnabas were sent out from, uh, from uh, Antioch to be the first uh, missionaries uh, to the world. Uh, that had been a mystery, but from that point on, it was no longer a mystery. Now, the same is true. In Revelation 17, God is speaking about some things that have not been understood until our day, because there are many, many truths in the Bible that have to do with the period of time in which we're now living as God is preparing the church and the world for Judgment Day that will come very quickly now as soon as Christ returns on the clouds of glory and every eye sees him it'll be the end of the world and that's 
very close at hand, and so many truths are being revealed which had been a mystery. And a mystery Babylon has to do with the local congregations. This is an awesome, a terrible, a horrible idea. But nevertheless, this is the way God teaches it, that uh, now that we are near the end, God is finished ha- using the local congregations to y- send the gospel into the world. And uh, they now are, uh, and God himself has abandoned them. The Holy Spirit is no longer present there. And instead, it is Satan himself who has been given the uh, rule over the local congregations. And now the rule of of uh, Satan has been typified by ancient Babylon that was ruled over by Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament days. And uh, he is t- uh, typifying Satan, for example, in Isaiah 14. And, and uh, so uh, the, now the mystery is, has been revealed uh, that the local congregations have become Babylon, that is the kingdom of Satan, and uh, therefore uh, she is called a harlot and is, uh, is no longer faithful to God at all. But uh, thank you, India, for that question. And now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Yes. Uh, how are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Good. You sound well. Um, I have a comment on Second Samuel um, chapter 18, verse 3, please. Second Samuel Chapter 18, verse 3. Let's look at that. Uh, There we read. um, Well, let's let's talk about. Let's begin with number one, uh, verse one, to get at the context. And David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. The situation is, incidentally, the setting is is that that. uh, uh, Absalom, the son of Solomon, has been uh, is in uh, in insurrection against David. He is trying to get the throne away from his father David, and and in fact is presently occupying Jerusalem. And David has been driven out of Jerusalem, uh, and now the preparations are being made for a final confrontation between Absalom and his armies uh, that have have rebelled against David's rule. And uh, David and those who are still uh, loyal to him. And David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Yittai, the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. Now verse 3. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, there will not care for us. They will not care for us, neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou art worth ten thousand of us, therefore now it is better that thou uh, succor us out of the city. That, In other words, uh, the uh, fact is they were really telling David, King David, no, don't you go and fight because... Uh, they will try to kill you, and uh, then Absalom will win, and it's better that you do not fight. And David went along with that idea. Now, what is your question? A comment on that is um, it's, it's uh, clear that um, there are certain people in God's um, uh, great plan of salvation that hold a very significant position, that were put in those positions uh, and um, I, too, I, I, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I think that you have a broad support in this, that you are one of those. You are worth very much, and, and, and especially at this time. You, uh, 
And um, and I, I don't. I'm real careful about flattery. I, I think that I am honest in saying this. But um, my concern is that um, you know you being in, a, in in the senior time of your life, and 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 this goes not only for you but also all senior citizens. I I just want to um, if if uh, people get real busy and and sometimes they just, they it, it just slips by them. But uh, my own mother, uh, in, in her later age, she, um, she had a, a stroke. Um, for, it, was a, it was a blockage uh, from the uh, blood vessel. And uh, it was interesting. They, they did a sonogram on her carotid artery after she had the stroke, but it was too late. And it showed that the carotid artery was blocked. And I know that there are procedures that are done that if a person's artery is, uh, is, is getting blocked, that they can clear that out. And I, I, I'm certain you've probably already had this time, but because you're so busy and, and uh, so many things going on, I thought I would just run that by you and, and everybody else out there, all, all the seniors and even people, you know, it's worth um, checking out and, and uh, to uh, ward off um, um, the possibility of that happening. Well, the fact is, you know, uh, um, uh, first of all, I'm under God's care, of course, but that doesn't mean that I should live uh, uh, live uh, in a dangerous way. And I do check, get checked out now and then. I'm pretty well aware of where my uh, physical weaknesses might be because I do believe a whole lot in prevention rather than waiting until something happens. But I do thank you for your concern, and uh, I, you know, there is an old adage, it's not biblical, of course, but an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, uh, and so I, I really do believe in prevention. But thank you for your concern, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Hi. Um... My question is regarding Christian and sin, and I would like you to pick apart First John chapter three and verse nine. First John chapter three, yeah. Well, First John chapter three verse nine is a wonderful and important. Well, <laughs> you know, every time I say a verse is particularly wonderful or important, I always have to. Uh, uh, a smile because really everything in the Bible is wonderful and important because it's all the Word of God. But here we read, Whosoever is born of God doth not continue in sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, the big question is, well, who is it that is born of God? Well, every true believer is born of God. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that ye must be born again, or ye must be born from above. But again, we have to re uh, look at that in the light of the whole Bible, and we find that when we become born again, uh, that is the moment that we become saved, our salvation, while judicially it is complete altogether because all of our sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for, and therefore God looks at us now uh, through the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But our salvation was only half complete in in application, and namely, we, we were given a brand new resurrected soul, but we still live in a body that can sin. And that is why we patiently and, and uh, sometimes impatiently wait for the return of the Lord Jesus, So, because at that time we will receive our glorified spiritual bodies, which then uh, will mean that our salvation has been completed in every sense. So therefore, when God says that which is born of God cannot sin, he's not speaking about a true believer as a whole personality, because as a whole personality, we still can sin because we are living in a body that has not yet been saved. But it's in our soul existence where we cannot sin. 
because we have been born of God. We've already been given eternal life. We are, our salvation is complete in our soul existence, but it still has to be completed in our body. And that is why there is a huge difference in the life of the true believer from the, someone who thinks he is saved. In the life of the true believer, there is an intense ongoing desire to do the will of God, given the fact that he has a soul, and, or she, he or she have, has a soul or a spiritual uh, existence in which they never want to sin again. And what does it mean when it says, and his seed also remaineth in him? The, the seed is Christ. The seed, he is the, uh, uh, he remains, it isn't like there's, it's a seed that's going to grow. It's, uh, he is spoken of as the seed. Uh, uh, the seed of Abraham is uh, what it really ties back to. Uh, uh, it is a synonym for Christ himself, that Christ indwells us. Uh, the Holy Spirit indwells us, the, uh, and we have been given a brand new resurrected soul. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes, Brother Cantor? Yes. Go ahead with yes, your call. Um, I, I have a question um, in Revelation. Chapter Revelation chapter two verse eight. Yeah, could you turn your radio off, please? Yes, I just did. I'm sorry. All right. Revelation two verse eight. Eight. Yes. Yeah. There we read, uh, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write: These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now, what is your question? Well, when Christ is speaking to this church, doesn't it seem that he is basically asking them to hold on until the, until the end? Uh, well, uh, uh, let, let's read that again. Um, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, there, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive, I know thy works in tribulation. Uh, he's not talking about holding on till the end that I read in that verse at all. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, the Christ is the one who is the first and the last, and, and he is the one who was dead. That is, he endured the wrath of God, suffered eternal, the equivalent of eternal damnation, the second death, and now is alive forevermore because he has uh, fully paid for the sins of all those he uh, went to hell for. Well, could you read on verse 10, please? And then verse 10, uh, For uh, uh, none of those things which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, here, what is your question about that verse? Well, he's he's talking to the church here. That's what I was I was trying to figure out. And compared to the other six churches that he basically is speaking speaking to, this is one church that he singles out and tells them. Well, he is to, actually, in in Revelation two and Revelation three, God has selected seven churches that were in existence before the Bible was completed. And he is speaking to each of these seven churches, giving certain instructions, setting forth a, a certain kinds of wisdom concerning them, because they are a picture of the whole church age, that is, of the, of the situations that churches are going to be facing all through the whole period of the church age that would come to an end once, uh, uh, once uh, uh, the fullness of time came for them, and that was uh, in our time. But uh, uh, as we, as we uh, look at what God has to say to them, 
we can see what is our expectation for the local church. For example, we see the church of Sardis, which was one of the seven churches. It already had become a dead church, even though there were still a few true believers. So what, as we analyze that, we realize, okay, a church can still exist and look like a bona fide church of Christ, a church that is uh, uh, under the authority of Christ, and yet it may be uh, essentially a dead church with very, very, very few members within it. On the other hand, we read about the church at Ephesus, and God is warning them, now if you don't return to your first love, and love has to do with obedience to the commands of God, then I'm going to take your candlestick away. And so again, he is warning that it's possible that can, you can lose your, uh, your um, uh, mandate that I have given you to be the light of the world, that is to uh, be the custodian of the Bible by which the world is to be evangelized, and uh, and uh, uh, so that you again are neutralized. And then, as a matter of fact, as we go on in history and we examine those seven churches even further, we find that after two or three hundred years, they all disappeared from sight. And so, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that local congregations have no uh, no right to believe that they will exist right until the end. Uh, they they can disappear also. And uh, and as we read about these churches, and we, we see, for example, in, in a number of them, where he speaks about Satan is already there. The, uh, your, your Satan's seat is there. Now, Christ is the ruler, and yet Satan has been able to bring into that church tares or weeds, those who appear to be true believers and yet are still under his authority. And in that way, he is already there. Uh, we read of uh, the Nicolaitans. We read about the woman that's called a Jezebel, uh, indicating that in the local congregations there can come uh, a t tremendous heresy that that re brings havoc into that congregation. So as we read about these seven churches, uh, they are enormous warnings uh, to the churches during the church age. Watch out. Watch out, because look what can happen to you. And you have no guarantee that God is going to care for you right up until the end of time or anything like that. That's not found anywhere in uh, this language of the seven churches. Okay, can I, can I ask one more question, please? Yes. Okay, my second question is in Matthew 5, verse 31 through, um, through 32. Matthew 5, 31. Let's look at that. Matthew 5, 31. We read there... Uh, it has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, that is, divorce his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her, that is, divorced, committeth adultery. Now, what is your question? My question is, why would Christ say something, say something like that if he knew there was absolutely no ground for divorce? Why would Christ say this? For, uh, 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 See, if, 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 if he knew that there, were, there was um, absolutely no ground or basis for a divorce, why would he say um, other than well, her unfaithfulness? Well, because, uh, you see, uh, uh, Christ uh, is, first of all, he is making sure that there's no misunderstanding about God's laws concerning marriage and divorce. And God had introduced a substitute law in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, that permitted God to divorce Israel, uh, who, to whom he was spiritually married to during the Old Testament days. And and uh, Israel had committed fornication repeatedly. That is, every time they rebelled against God, that was spiritual fornication. And according to the law, 
of Deuteronomy 22, uh, the uh, God should have killed uh, ancient Israel. That is, uh, as his uh, uh, as his spiritual wife, he should have destroyed them because of all this fornication. So God, Christ introduced a substitute law in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, where he said, If a man found some uncleanness in his wife, he could write a bill of divorcement and put her away. But the Jewish uh, nation had made a, a shambles of that law because they decided that word uncleanness had to do with ceremonially uncle- being ceremonially unclean. And any time they had a wife that had any discharge from her body, like when she had her monthly or when she had a cold and had a running nose or whatever, she was ceremonially unclean and he could... Uh, uh, they could divorce her, and uh, that made a shambles of the marriage institution altogether. And so the first thing Christ does is make a correction. No, I did not mean uh, that you could divorce for fornication. I'm, uh, excuse me, for just anything, any ceremony, uh, uncleanness. What, What that law was teaching was that you could divorce for fornication. And it didn't say either that that a wife could divorce her husband for fornication. It was only a husband could divorce a wife. And then on top of that, Christ introduced another law, and he said, Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So that is that that law now is on the books. Then a, a, a year or two later, when he came to Matthew chapter 19, God Christ further developed the law of of marriage and divorce by rescinding Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, when he says, From the beginning it was not so a man is uh, a... Uh, a, a man is bound to his wife as long as he lives, and uh, he is not to. Do, there is not to be any divorce. And he explains in those verses that uh, 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 that why he had allowed divorce up until that time. But uh, we have to take all of this step by step in order to get the full understanding of God's intention for the marriage institution because it was a super, super important part of God's law. But now we're going to pause for this message. Presently, as you may know, we have 20 individuals in the Philippines who are very, very busy attempting to pass out uh, more than 200,000 Does God Love You tracts in the native language there of, say, uh, the uh, native language uh, uh, and as well as in the English language. And uh, now we have a communique from them as to what happened this past Saturday and Sunday, or this, last, uh, this past Friday and Saturday, rather. Uh, It begins with this. We received the first batch, about a third of the whole order of 70,000 additional Sabuano tracts last night for distribution distribution today. They had originally come with 200,000 divided between English and Sabuano and now have uh, uh, ordered 70,000 additional. and, And at this point in time, had received about a third of these and uh, therefore now some teams went to outlying areas one went over a bridge to the city of Lapu Lapu on the island of Makan the city is named after the native chieftain chieftain who killed Ferdinand Magellan in in the year 1521 when he claimed these islands for the king of Spain. The team was able to distribute all of its tracts and Bibles by early afternoon in a busy market and to have many opportunities to interact personally with the people to tell them about the true gospel and the ministry of Family Radio. We have met several listeners in many locations and are always blessed by those encounters. Uh, They are listeners who can listen 
principally by AM radio that were, which uh, comes from the southern part of the country of Taiwan uh, on a 600,000 AM, uh, uh, 600 kilowatt AM uh, broadcast facility. Another team went to a different market area on uh, uh, Mactan Island with the same good results. Yet another team visited several schools in Cebu City, and the team leader provided this report of their activities. Our assignment today was to visit a few colleges and high schools, and what a blessing it turned out to be for us. The students here are very kind and well-mannered, and they readily accepted the tracks, kept them, and read them intently as they walked along. If someone had already received one, they would politely say, I already have one, and point to a folder or book in their hands. Some say the more common word, finish, which is used everywhere around here to indica indicate that they had received a tract earlier. We were allowed to stand at the main entrance to a large university right in front of the security guards until we handed out about 2,500 tracks. Then we left for a while and came back at about 4 o'clock p.m. when the day school students were coming out and the night school students were going in. There were thousands of people coming and going through the gate, and we were able to hand out about 6,000 tracts in a short time in that one place. We pray that God will use His words on those tracts to draw many of those people to Himself for salvation. We continue to thank God for His protection and guidance and the wonderful reception to the Does God Love You tracks everywhere. And we have gone, the, we have gone on this trap, uh, trip. And for the growing attendance at our nightly Bible studies, a busload of about 15 people from a Christian school came in at 9.30 p.m. last evening as we were finishing our Bible study. They made a two-hour journey from the city of Danan, located north of here, just to attend the meeting. So we had another Bible study for their benefit until 11 o'clock p.m., and they headed back home with some free Bibles and family radio materials. We received today the second third of our order for 70,000 Sabuano tracks this evening for distribution tomorrow. Now, on Saturday, two teams left the hotel at about 5 o'clock in the morning to catch two different high-speed ferries to cities on two different islands. They went to the cities of Leyte and Bohol, which which uh, are two-hour rides to the northeast and southeast, respectively. One, uh, team, one team leader um, uh, made these comments about the trip. Our team of four ambassadors went to the city of Ormac on the island of Leyte. We traveled for two hours on a high-speed double-hull catamaran that traveled at about 40 miles per hour, and the seating resembled that of a wide-body jet airplane. Boarding was similar also with security checks, sniffing dogs, and seat assignments. We handed our tracks all along the way in the terminal, on the boat, and on the pier, in our Mac without any objections by anyone. Then, to our surprise, there was a huge market and bus terminal right at the pier where we were able to hand out several thousand tracks before catching an afternoon boat back to Cebu City. It is such a blessing and a pleasure to distribute here because of the excellent acceptance and retention of the tracks and to see so many people reading them intently everywhere we work. 
The team that went to the island of Bohol had similar experiences. They traveled on a single-hull airplane-like speedboat to the city of Tigbilaran on the southern tip of the island and worked in a large market that processed and sold all manner of fish, meats, fruits, and vegetables. Many vendors were there when they arrived, but very few customers because of the big shopping day was yesterday. However, they were able to hand out all of their tracts and Bibles by working in an adjacent bus station, then at a big modern shopping mall about a block away, and then in the busy city center before returning to the pier for the boat ride back to Cebu City in the afternoon. Two other teams traveled by bus to the cities of Danao, two hours to the north, and Toledo City, a mile and a, or an hour and a half to the west, and one leader provided this report. We experienced the same good response to the tracks in Toledo City as in everywhere else we have worked, and one incident stands out in my mind. I gave some Sabuano tracks to a group of young men, and one of them asked me if I could read the Sabuano language on the track. I said, no, but I know what it, uh, the track says. He then proceeded to point to various parts of the track, asking repeatedly in a joking manner, what does this say, with the whole group laughing along with him. Then I took a track and pointed to the last sentence and said, I know that this says, Are you ready to meet God? And I told the group, This is a very serious message about God's salvation plan from the Bible. Not a joking matter. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return soon, and if you are not saved, you will stand before his judgment throne and be found guilty of breaking his laws and be cast into the eternal lake of fire. They all became very quiet and started reading the tracts as I left. The Christian school group from Daneo showed up on time for our Bible study tonight, and we had a total of about 25 guests in attendance. We received the last third of our previous order for 70,000 tracts this evening for dis distribution tomorrow, which will be Sunday. And we ordered an additional 20,000 for distribution on Monday. That brings the total number of tracks for this trip to 290,000, of which 80,000 are, are in the English language and 210,000 are in the Sabuano language. And uh, uh, this uh, is the uh, final statement uh, for that day from the mission team in, uh, in uh, Cebu City. Well, we surely thank them for their report, and we uh, want to continue to be praying for them that God will bless these dear people, that there may be many who will come to know Jesus as Savior as they hear from the Word of God. But now shall we go back to our calls and take our next caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing, Brother Gabby? Very well, thank you. Um, can you read Matthew 24 and 3? Matthew 24, verse 3? Let's, yes. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Matthew 24, verse 3. And as, and as he sat down upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Now, what is your question? Okay, first question is, um, what does Mount Olive represent? What does Mount Olive represent? Mount Olives. Oh, yes. well, the Mount of Olives, uh, if, if God uses that to il illustrate something spiritual, 
uh, it really is talking about the body of believers. Remember in uh, Romans it speaks, says that we're grafted uh, into the olive tree. Uh, and uh, and uh, Mount, of course, has to do with kingdom. And so it really represents the kingdom of God as it exists at any time in history. Okay, yeah, I kind of thought so. I was wondering why he would call the um, the two witnesses, which are the true believers, why he would call them the olive tree. Because they are identified with the uh, kingdom of God, as we read in Romans, uh, where is that? In Romans chapter 11, I believe it is. Let me turn to that a moment. In uh, where it talks about the body of believers are... are our, oh no, Romans, let me get that a minute. Romans, if you go to Romans chapter 11, um, where he, uh, uh, where we have been grafted into an olive tree. Um, uh, it's in beginning in verse. Uh, it's, uh, 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the, if the uh, uh, root be holy, we are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. The olive tree is used here as a symbol of the kingdom of God. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Ezra 10, verse 10 through like about 12. Uh, so kind of trying to figure out the divorce thing. Are you talking about Ezra? Yes. The book of Ezra? Yes, so chapter Verse 10 through about 12. Chapter 10, verse 10 to 12. Have I got that right? And Ezra the prophet stood up and said unto them, Is that the verse? Yes. Uh, ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the uh, trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice as thou hast said so must we do yeah now this is a very very unusual situation God is using this as a picture of the fact that we are to separate from uh, the kingdom of Satan, if we are part of that, uh, uh, when we become a true believer. Uh, this is not talking about, God does not use the word divorce here, as near as I can tell. He's using the word of separation, uh, because God uh, has rules about divorce. But, uh, but uh, he is making a point that they are to separate from these wives, because uh, they are not to be... Uh, uh, they were uh, should never have uh, married them in the first place, and so now they have to separate from them. But uh, as near as we can tell, it meant that they just had to remain uh, in that condition. Now they could not continue uh, uh, as if they were married, even though they were not divorced. Thank you, Brother Candy. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Is it, is it true that um, there are more men going to heaven and less women going to heaven? I mean, hell? No, wait. Is it true that there are more men going to heaven than women and more women going to he hell and than women? Uh, there's no truth in either one of those statements. We have no idea how many men or how many women are going to heaven. Uh, God is not a respecter of persons. A man doesn't have an advantage over a woman, and a woman doesn't have an advantage over a man. 
Uh, it's it, curiously, that's a curious question. Uh, you know, uh, I've been in a lot of congregations in my lifetime, and uh, and in many congregations there are far more women there than men. And you begin to wonder, well, are there any men that have an interest in the Word of God in some of these uh, congregations? But that doesn't prove anything either, because just because a person was a member of a congregation did not guarantee in any way that that person was a child of God. But from what we read in the Bible, God is not a respecter of persons, and uh, there's no way that we could say that a woman has more opportunity than a man to become saved, or the man, a woman, than a woman to become saved. But thank you, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. How, how do you do to see <coughs> for the cabin? Thank you very well. Okay, let me ask you a question. When uh, the verse of John chapter 3, verse 16, and uh, well, you could, if you could go ahead and read that for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, or believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, what is your question? Okay. Now, uh, me growing, I, I've grown up my whole life. I'm a 35 year old man. I've grown up my whole life believing and uh, being taught through the Catholic Church to love Jesus and to love Him like no one or no other being on earth. Um, I believe that it may have been motivated by certain feelings of uh, fear and going to hell behind it. But in the same sense, I always wear my rosary beads and I always feel close to Jesus every day. Now, I don't believe in the same sense that people who are on that tract necessarily because they go and worship in a building that they're necessarily all going to be damned and going to hell. I know that this is something that you feel strongly towards, towards 2011 and the ending of the world and what your prophecy is and whatnot. And we all hope if that day does come true that as many people who are supposed to be going there obviously will be going there. But I feel it's very unfair to say anybody who's a Catholic is definitely not in the right boat. And it scares me to think that I've just wasted 35 years of my life by being taught that. Well, the question is not being whether we're fair or unfair. The question is, are we going to bring the truth? My, my, let's suppose that someone here is uh, on a path that they are very happy with and they're very, very uh, truly believing that all is well with their soul and, they're, and yet someone else comes with more truth from the Bible and is making some statements that, that uh, indicate that uh, that person probably is following a wrong path altogether. Well, it's not a matter of fairness, it's a matter of uh, do we want to see our fellow man go to hell just because someone is uh, is uh, happy or or has become convinced he's on the right path doesn't mean that he's on the right path you must remember that every human uh, uh, intuitively knows that uh, he's got an answer to God and he has selected a religion that he trusts in or that he's most comfortable with in some way and it can be a religion that has nothing to do with the Bible like the Buddhist religion or the Hindu religion or the Mohammedan religion or it can be a religion that has some identification with the Bible like the Roman Catholic or the Mormons or the uh, Jehovah Witnesses and so on or it can be one that has even more identification with the Bible but uh, just having uh, uh, sincerity and, and, and faithfulness to your religion, whatever it may be, that is not the, the solution. The solution has to be, uh, am I truly a child of God? Because if I'm not a child of God, I'm going to end up at hell. God, Christ wasn't playing games when he said in Matthew 7, verse 21, there will be many in that day who say, Lord, Lord. Already we're seeing he's talking about those who really, really believe they have an intimate relationship with Christ. 
They say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? That is, they felt they had been given a real mandate to declare the word of God to others. Did we, do, did we not do many mighty works in thy name? And, and uh, so on. And yet God is going to say, Christ is going to say them, to them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. Now the tragedy is that now there is no, at that point when this is going on, that God, Christ is talking about in Matthew 7, and it will take place exactly as he says, and that day is judgment day, there's no more mercy, there's no more salvation, there's no more grace, there's no more possibility of salvation, it's all done, it's all over. And isn't it a lot better to uh, be uh, uh, to begin to think? I better I better make sure I know where I am spiritually. I better sure make sure that I'm following the salvation plan of the Bible because I may not find out I'm not saved. And if I'm not saved, uh, that means that if I die or the end comes, I'm going to end up with those who. Uh, depart from me, I, I never knew you, and, and I'm going to end up in hell. And at least today, if I know I'm not saved, I can still cry to God for mercy, and I can still uh, 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 hope that maybe I'm one of God's elect. And I do know that the Bible teaches that today God is still saving a great multitude. So this is the this is the question we it isn't the idea of putting down a religion or putting down a person who is sincere or a person who is uh, really trying his best to do it right that isn't the idea the idea is to ha help each of us to face the big question really what is God's salvation plan there's only one and, and I better know what it is, because if I'm following the wrong plan, it's disaster. And that's the last thing I want to have to happen to me. And so uh, uh, in, in, our, in, in our love for our fellow man, we would be a, a, a monster if we did not try to constantly describe what the true gospel is, even though... It is a, 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 a total affront. It is totally uh, unacceptable what we're saying to a great many people who don't really want to be disturbed. They would like to remain where they are, but uh, it has no value spiritually if they're not if they don't know if they're not following the the true gospel, the true salvation plan of the Bible. Uh, sir, I'm not, I'm not that person who's trying to say I'm happy where I'm at and I don't mind going to hell. No, I do not want to go to hell. So my question to you is simple. It's this. What do you do now if you've been believing something for 35 years and, okay, you've come and you've shown me some other road to go down? What would I do as a person saying, well, that didn't seem right to me, but now maybe I'm, I'm more willing to listen to what you have to say? What would be the daily uh, course that I would go about taking to ensure that I am one of the people who are going to go to heaven? How do you explain that to a person who, who supposedly learned this is the way to do it? What's your way? Do I wake up every day and read the Bible all day long and go around and tell everybody I'm okay? Now we need to help each other, and now we need to get our own type of uh, system going here, whether it's under religion or not. What do you do every single day to ensure that, hey, you followed the wrong path, but now this apparently is the correct path. What well, do let, you me, have let me, to let I, me know? I, under, I understand your question, and it's fair. It's a very fair question. Uh, the fact is that I, I don't know how to get anybody saved. I can't get anybody saved. Nobody can. That's God's business altogether. Uh, but I do know that God tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the Bible is the word of God. And so the first thing that, uh, that uh, I want to tell anybody to do is start reading the Bible. Now, you spoke of that. Well, am I going to sit here and read the Bible all day as if, uh, as if that is uh, 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 kind of nonsensical? 
Well, the fact is, we got to start reading the Bible, recognizing this is the Word of God. This is God speaking to me. And if God is going to save a person, he's going to apply that word to that person's heart. God has to do it. And I don't know of any other way. And so we're not telling anybody you've got to join up here or join up there or here's another religion over here that you ought to think about. All we're asking, all we're uh, 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 instructing is from the Word of God, read the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. Now, we do uh, do offer teaching materials uh, uh, to help uh, 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 an understanding. You can, you can write Family Radio or call Family Radio, or what must I do to be saved, and so on, to learn more and more about what the Bible teaches about this. But that isn't where the truth is going to be. The truth is the Word of God. This is what you really want to listen to. But thank you for calling and sharing. It's very curious, uh, and we have a caller on the line who's asking a very, very important question. But it's in, interesting, you know, that every uh, church, every denomination is trying to build a larger and larger membership, a larger and larger organization. Family Radio, as we are teaching here, are not interested in becoming in building a large organization. We don't know who even uh, who even listens to Family Radio. We make no attempt to know who listens. Uh, all we know is that we've been commanded to tell the world, tell people to read the Bible because the Bible is the Word of God, and there. God, and let God do the work of salvation in the hearts of those that God wants to do the work of. It's totally the work of God. Now, how God does that and for whom he does it, I have no idea. I have no idea. God will do it in his own way. But uh, we will uh, simply try to give as much information as we can of what we understand the Bible is teaching. Uh, we constantly are searching the Bible to, uh, to uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture so that we uh, become as faithful as possible to the teaching of the Bible. But we don't know who is listening. We don't know who becomes saved. That's God's business. We do know, however, that there is a great multitude wh which no man can number that are being saved uh, somewhere out there. And uh, that is because that's what the Bible declares. But thank you for calling. And, uh, and uh, uh, in, on this program, we are, we are, our deep concern is to see people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no interest in just seeing membership or, or uh, trying to get a whole lot of people uh, on our side, that's God's business. We don't have, we don't know anything about that. But shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camp, and I have a few questions I want to ask. Um, it's about reading the Bible, and I wanted to know first of all if I was to read the Bible, um, like say, for instance. I asked God a question, and I wanted an answer from him. Would he, um, let me see, would he um, point out a scripture to me to read, or would I have to read from the beginning to the end to get understanding? Well, uh, uh, you see, uh, I'm, I didn't quite get your question. You're asking about reading the Bible, and you wanted me to point out a scripture that says which? Okay. If I was trying to ask God a question, like I wanted to communicate with him, yes. and I know that the only way that he communicates with us is through the Bible. So if I was to open up the Bible, um, just say wherever it happens to open up at, would it be something that he will want me to know? Well, the, the, uh, you know, we don't uh, play games with God at all. We simply 
Uh, there are, uh, let, let me uh, outline two or three principles here. Number one, we have to recognize that the Bible is the Word of God. So we approach the Bible with awe. We approach it with, with uh, trembling because this is God speaking to me. If we approach the Bible just like any old book, uh, like any book that man has written, uh, it's not going to mean anything. But we have to approach the Bible. This is God speaking to me. Secondly, we approach the Bible recognizing that I don't understand at all what God is really saying. Now and then, as I read, there may be a sentence that I understand a little better, but basically... I, there's so much of it, I don't know what God is saying. Uh, but it, it, I can ask God. And you know, now we come to the question of what do I ask God? Uh, do I simply come with a, a, a shopping list of items? Oh, Lord, I want you to tell me about this and tell me about that. No. We go to the Bible and we say, Lord, uh, 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 we earnestly desire to know more about this question, but you in your own way have to open my spiritual eyes because, uh, and God may or may not. Uh, um, uh, it, it isn't a question of uh, if I ask a question, God is going to give me an, an immediate answer. No way. He uh, the Bible, one of the principles God gives us is that we wait upon the Lord. And so we have a question. Well, okay, we uh, we can pray, oh, Lord, I have this question. Please, uh, could, uh, could there somehow be an answer? And yet I know I have to wait upon Thee. And in the meanwhile, I keep reading the Bible slowly, carefully. And, uh, and maybe as I read along, I'll run into a verse that does speak to my question. Maybe I won't read a verse that speaks to my question and it's going to remain unanswered. For uh, Maybe I'll never get an answer to it. And uh, that's okay because I know God is in charge. He will tell me what He wants to tell me and that's good enough. But, but the important thing is that I begin to recognize this Bible is God's word to me, and and it's just not uh, well. I got to sit around reading all day, reading the Bible. No, it's the opportunity that I have to sit down with that Bible and slowly, carefully, prayerfully read this verse and the next verse and the next verse, and and from time to time. Uh, I may read something that begins to, I begin to have some understanding, and I can communicate with God at any point and say, Oh, Lord, help me to understand. And, and if I do understand, Oh, Lord, help me to be obedient, because I know this is a law book. You are giving me commandments by which I have to live. And, and uh, I, I, this is, I know this is enormously serious business. Uh, this is not something where I'm playing games with God or, or mocking God or, or poking fun of the Bible. This is something that is, is super serious. This is your word to me. And, oh, Lord, how I want to know truth. And, and uh, maybe, maybe in the process... Uh, I too can become a child of thine. I have that hope that maybe I too could be one of God's elect, but I know I have to wait upon thee. Okay, now, one other question I want to ask, well, actually two. Um, now, when I read the Bible, should I read it from Genesis on or... Would it be all right for me to open it from a certain chapter and read on? You know, the fact is, the whole Bible is the Word of God. And uh, from uh, one time, you may just want to read it uh, fairly rapidly just to get the general uh, uh, historical setting of what, of, of how God has uh, uh, written. You begin right at Genesis chapter 1 and just read through. Uh, but on the other hand, you may 
uh, after you read for a little while, you may open up to another part of the Bible and simply read. Uh, it may be the Psalms, it may be Philippians, it may be Matthew, and and you read there. Wherever you're reading, it is super important. And it isn't. It isn't so much where am I reading, but it, the important thing is that I am recognizing this is the word of God and I am to tremble before it and, and recognize <coughs> that each and everything God has said is exceedingly important even though uh, much of it I can't understand and as a matter of fact if you find that you're in a chapter and you just can't understand there's nothing to keep you from going to another part of the Bible to see what's maybe there's a chapter there that I can understand more readily and but you have to be uh, take time with the Word of God <coughs> and uh, thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How are you, Mr. Campy? Very well, thank you. Go ahead with your call. Um, yes, my my question is, um, um, you know, you have a lot of um, people that are devoted to listening to family radio. So I, I want to ask you, um, what is your your uh, your personal? Do you listen to family radio yourself? What is my personal view on which? <laughs> Um, like, do you listen to family radio a lot yourself? Well, I, I, I don't quite understand your question. I've been uh, with family radio since its very beginning, and, and I recognize that uh, we are what we are, not because of any wisdom on my part or anybody else's part, but God has raised us up for such a time as this that we try to be as faithful as possible in presenting what uh, the, the uh, truths of the Bible and encouraging people to recognize that the Bible is God's Word. It is the only Word of God, and every word in the Bible, in the original languages, uh, is absolutely crafted by God, written by God, and and it's exactly what God wants, and so we we never never uh, never uh, doubt what the Bible is saying. Do you have a favorite program that you listen to on family radio? Oh, I, uh, you know, I, my problem is that I'm spending so much time studying and uh, and uh, making programs for family radio i don't have very much time to listen to family radio i have very very little time uh once in a while i i try to listen to maybe a uh family bible study from uh, uh that is on which maybe i uh, had uh, had uh, uh provided maybe two years or three years earlier and so I learn all over again from that because I don't remember everything that I ever taught but I don't really have a lot of time to listen I, I'm most of the time I'm uh, when I have any spare time I I'm trying to study the Word of God oh I'd just like to say one more thing um I would just like to remind all of us that you know since you began teaching about 2011 you were saying um, seven years at the time. Now already it's uh, less than five years, and I'd just like to remind everybody that. And uh, thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Could you please direct me to specific verses in the Bible that deal with the end of the church age, please? Well, I, I can give you a, a two or three verses. There are a whole, a great number of them. But, uh, for example, in Matthew 24, verse 15, God is, uh, that chapter is dealing with this period of time in which we presently are, the time of great tribulation that precedes the return of Christ. Because in verse 28 or 29, Matthew 24 says, 
uh, that immediately after this tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shine and Christ will return. So, and it's during that period of great tribulation and the whole chapter, chapter 24 of Matthew as well as uh, Mark 13 is devoted to that particular period of time. We read in verse uh, 21, and there will be great tribulation such as this world has never known. And then in verse 15, as it is discussing this, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Now, there's only one holy place that the world knows about or, or the Bible knows about throughout the New Testament era. And that has been the local congregations because they were mandated by God to evangelize the world. They were mandated to be the custodian of the Bible, and that made them the holy place. They actually had become the external representation of the kingdom of God in this world. But now he is talking about the abomination of desolation. And when we examine that phrase in the light of what we read in Daniel, for example, we know that means that Satan has come to occupy the holy place. And uh, that accords with such a passage as Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, where God says that the man of sin will take his seat in the temple. The temple, again, being uh, uh, a representation of the church age, uh, because the church age uh, externally represented the kingdom of God, even as the temple did during the Old Testament time when Israel was the representation of the kingdom of God. But now the man of sin, and that can be shown to be Satan, has taken his seat, a figure of speech, that he rules there. And, uh, and that is why... Uh, the abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place. And now what are we to do? Those in Judea. Now the local congregations now are called Judea because, again, in the Old Testament, Judea was a representation of the kingdom of God externally. And, and, now, and therefore the local congregations are now, are, we can call them spiritually Judea. Let those in who are in Judea flee to the mountains and when we examine that phrase uh, to find out what God is talking about as we examine the Bible it means flee to Christ we we are not to have any more uh, trust in the local congregations which during the church age are the place where we were to be under the oversight of spiritual rulers like elders and deacons and so on now that's one passage that that speaks to this uh, when we read uh, uh, Revelation 18 verse 4 God there speaks about Satan having uh, having or that is in Revelation 17 and and in 2nd Thessalonians 2 and so on of Satan having having uh, come to rule in the local congregation so they have become spiritually Babylon and God warns those in Babylon to flee from Babylon and uh, and uh, that is to get out now th th there's a lot of other verses similar to this that is why family radio we have prepared a couple of books uh, uh, not not to tell people what to do but to assist them in looking at the Bible so they can learn from the Bible what they must do but one book is the end of the church age and after the other is wheat and tares uh, uh, which is uh, based on the parable of wheat and tares that we read about in Matthew 13 and those books uh, can assist anyone who's seriously interested in this, and we all ought to be an enormously interested in it, to, uh, to see ex what does the Bible have to say about all of this. And frankly, uh, the more I have studied this through the years, the, I am amazed at how much the Bible has to say about this. Very much, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. 
And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Brother Camping. I have a uh, two-part question, and also I have a comment. Uh, I would just like to say I listen to family radio all the time. Uh, I've downloaded all the open forums, and I listen all day long and all night. And uh, I just want to, uh, I know I'm speaking for a whole host of uh, God's children when I say that we love you dearly, uh, Brother Camping. And uh, my question is uh, 1 Corinthians 7.39. 1 Corinthians 7.39, yes, that is a, a verse that really locks it in when we talk about uh, that there is not to be divorce of any kind. We read there that uh, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whomsoever she will, only in the Lord. In other words, God, uh, if the wife is bound uh, to her husband, then the husband obviously is bound uh, to the wife. And, and therefore, even though we can go through the antics of, of a uh, divorce or whatever in God's sight, uh, no, you're still bound to each other and you cannot marry anyone else as long as your present spouse is living. Uh, Brother Camping, my question is, uh, before m marrying my wife, uh, it, was, it was apparent to me that she was a true child of God. We spoke of the Bible, did Bible studies. I, I extensively uh, showed her in the Bible where it was not appropriate to divorce, and she believed it. And shortly after we married and were living together, I, I, I noticed that she just was not obedient to God's Word, and she would mock me, and uh, I, I, I w was willing to stay with her and, and do whatever it took, and I, I overlooked a lot of things, and it, I wasn't very hard on her, but I was trying to be an example all the while praying for her, and it just got to the point where she began to hate me. And now um, she's petitioned me for divorce, and, and I, I know that I cannot remarry, and, and I from time check the obituaries to see if maybe she's the Lord's taken her by now. But last time I spoke to her, and every time I spoke to her, I just get a very evil response, and I've, I've even uh, asked her forgiveness, and, and, I've, uh, and she says it's just better that we stay separate and 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 i find a, a peace when i hand it over to god but my question is being so obedient to the lord why would he put me through such a testing program at such a young age well i don't know uh, uh, how god works i do know this that uh, we husbands sometimes think we are doing pretty well and really we're uh, we are not doing that uh, uh, being that obedient either I, uh, I think every husband should read Ephesians 5 every week uh, where it says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and, lay, and gave his life for it in other words uh, uh, we uh, first of all when we're married we have to think always what is best for my wife and we're to deny ourselves we we a lot of times think we are entitled to certain things as the husband as the man in the house but frankly if it's you know, whatever is required we want to try to show our wife that we truly love her that we want the best for her and everything and that we're not thinking about ourselves and that's very hard to do but that's that's one thing but then in spite of everything now the Lord has put you through a testing program uh, he has taken your wife in divorce or he's allowed your wife to divorce you already are thinking about remarriage. You're looking at the obituaries, I heard you say, uh, wondering if she dies. Now, why are you doing that? Because you really would like to marry again. And uh, you have, and if, uh, I could be dead wrong in this, of course, but uh, it, it could be that you are, have betrayed the fact that 
that really you uh, uh, you uh, uh, are not content to live singly uh, if that is God's plan for you. Uh, you really want something more, and you're. Uh, you're not really, uh, you're, you're not content in the state you are. You know, there are rules in the Bible. Be content in whatever state you are. And so uh, uh, my, I, 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 of course, don't know anything about your situation, but uh, if I were in any situation like that, I would spend a lot of time looking at myself. Am, am I really Am I really living to God's glory, or do I have certain desires and wants that uh, are not being satisfied, and and uh, therefore uh, I, I'm uh, that also increases my unhappiness. Uh, but uh, that's all I can offer to you is just uh, take it to the Lord, and and oh Lord, uh, uh, have mercy, give me wisdom, and work in me to will and to do of Your good pleasure and not of my good pleasure. But Brother Camping, can you give me a, an example? I know Paul stated that it was a, a blessing to be live single. I know we're on the edge of eternity. Can, can you give me a, a, an example of, of, a, of living a life singly as a eunuch, so to say, and, and can well, you give possible. me an example of a, of a testing program that somebody went through in the Bible? Well, the Bible, the, the Apostle Paul was a eunuch. He didn't. He never did marry, and his life was full. His life was, uh, uh, you know, full of, uh, of tribulation too. You know, as he faithfully declared the word of God. Life is not going to be easy on any of us. But uh, 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 you, you see, you've got to be careful that under what. What your real problem is is that you're not you're not ready to accept it. At least it sounds to me, and I could be dead wrong again. I I hate like everything to make a judgment and it matters. Uh, uh, and, but I, but just in trying to assist you in your thinking, uh, it could be that you are not satisfied with what God has allowed in your life, and you want something different. And so you're uneasy and you're unhappy, and instead of just leaning back on God's almighty arms and saying, well, if this is the way God wants it, let it be. Let me uh, turn my attention to Christ and quit thinking about what I am uh, 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 being shortchanged on. Uh, let me stop thinking about the fact that now I have to remain single and and just wearying myself about that uh, uh, and turn that around and say okay the lord has made me single now how can i live to god's glory oh lord help me just to focus on you amen thank you brother Campbell. thank you for calling and sharing and we have come to the end of our time the lord willing we'll be back together at another and the next day for another open for him. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you. And don't stop reading the Bible. Don't stop reading the Bible. Uh, and always remember, as you read it, it is the Word of God. Good night.